Welcome to a brand new episode of Spin the Wheel. I am your host, Wheelchair21, and today we will be returning to The Stuff I Binge. This will be part four, I believe, since last week we had a slight intermission due to all the crazy news we got from Tel Aviv scans, as well as the Tamashii World Tour Osaka. Now, we're going to talk about Toku. It's still Toku. We still have a little bit more of the series that I've binged in Toku to talk about. And most of it is the Ultra series. A little bit is about Garo. And then some's about some series probably either people have heard of or not even took a chance to watch like show. Like they're just shows that are on the internet. They've been subbed and people have the chance to go out and enjoy them. But they just haven't sat down and looked at them yet. However... You know, I was one of those people that jumped into tokusatsu head first and went all over pretty much the map in what was obtainable and easy to view. Now, there's other shows out there. There's still so many other tokusatsu programs out there that just never been subbed fully and are raw. And I'm not going to really put them on this list just because there's stuff like Spider-Man and a lot of the other Inishimori heroes and just some other random ones that like were either made from Toho, random ones that are not from the Ultra series made by Subaraya and other studios throughout like the course of the late 60s or should I say the late 70s to the early 80s. There's just some really, really weird ones out there. So we're going to talk about just the ones particularly that I did. So... I want to start with the Garo franchise, due to the fact that the Garo franchise has become pretty well established after having its sort of hiatus, which came from the original series, the original TV movie, and that was about it. We were hinted at getting other series, but then they just never came, they were delayed in production, and after like four years maybe, five years, they finally went back and revisited the product and started making more seasons. They made movies. They're making, I think, uh, technically like guidance. And they're working on just doing some crazy stuff with the product, especially due to the fact that it has two anime series, which are both distributed by Funimation. So when it comes to Garo, I got in like right around the time TV Nihon had been subbing it. Like, I think. I started watching the show somewhere around episode 14 to 18, so already most of the series was already done, and I waited for it to finish because I checked and I found out that the episode count was going to be like a short 25 episode series with a scheduled TV movie, so I waited. As soon as it was done, I jumped on it, and I really did enjoy it. It was really awesome, really interesting, and really good. I liked the designs of the armors. I liked the way that the world was set up and created. And I liked how the Midnight Sun movie, it didn't really wrap things up, but it made you think that there was going to be a sequel because there was the intent to have the Kiba series be like a prequel that ties in everything, and then there was foreshadow that there'd be like a third series that either talks about Zero or tries to wrap up the story of the world. That was all like, not spoilers, but theories that came out from people in Japan as well as fans just trying to do as much research on the project as possible. So... I love watching that first season, and I really did love watching the Midnight Sun specials. Like, I watched them a lot until we were able to get Red Requiem, uh, the Kiba Gaiden, the Makai Senki series, the Dragon of the Blue Tears film, as well as Zero Black Blood. Now, everything that came after, I think I enjoyed mostly the Makai Senki and Zero the Black Blood series, as I've watched those more excessively than the first season. Or I should say not... Just, yeah, not as more than, but just the same amount. With the fact is, after that, I kind of, like I say, I go in and out of the whole Garo franchise. Because, like, afterwards, they started kind of drifting away from the main story and whatnot. That it kind of got kind of confusing for me. Not confusing, but, like, they kind of just started jumping around. And there just 
really trying to make this really expansive universe about the series. However, there are two projects that already came out that I want to check out, because there was Garo Ashura, which was about the first ever person to ever hold the Garo armor, which is a guy called Goki, Goki, who was actually played by Hiroshi Tanahashi in this TV film. Now, the thing I find hilarious about it is, like, they actually made Tanahashi a Makai Knight, but not just any Makai Knight, but technically the titular Makai Knight for the franchise, which I find hilarious. The fact that uh, Togi Ma Makabe is in the series, too, or in the movie, too, is really cool, and I don't know how this, like, kind of slipped by me. I feel like how this slipped by me was due to the fact that, like, a lot of the Toku guys that I know that run sites other than myself kind of just don't really enjoy wrestling as much as I do. So, like, for them, they kind of, like, just, like, passed it to the side. as like, eh, whatever. But then when, like, Tanahashi's in a Kamen Rider production, because he's a well-known Kamen Rider fan, they're all on that shit. Like, it's, like, crack. Like, they're always jumping to it. So I want to see Garo Ashtara, and I need to see Zero Dragon Blood, because I saw a fight scene from that where he turns into, like, the full bestial form and got wings and crap and was fighting a damn dragon. And I'm like, this shit is amazing. So I really cannot wait to start actually picking up the other Garo series that I've yet to see and watching them when I got the time. And before we go into, like, Ultraman, we still have, like, those few other series that I watched that I'm going to sandwich in to this episode, which are the Shosei Shin series, which was actually a production by Toho and Konami. It was pretty much about, like, these universal galactic kind of earthly celestial, like, heroes scene where they were, like, kind of like a mix between all of the Toei kind of brands of Rider, Sentai, and Metal Hero. Like, they had mechas, they had weapons, they had upgrades... And they had, like, all these weird expansive teams. And originally, if I recall, the series themselves were not set in the same chronological universes. But they were eventually then all tied in, I think, in the final series or the movie. Which also made an appearance by, like, the Gotengo. And so what went on was, like, they were trying to protect the Earth. And crazy crap would always happen, as well as when Toho was doing the production for these suits, they would take, like, scraps and leftover suits of some of their Godzilla monsters and turn them into the giant monsters that were plaguing the city in the series sent down by, like, the villains. Now, the reason I'm not too in-depth on what actually happened was is that I haven't watched the Shosei Shin series since, like, they either aired or since, like, I watched them the first time, which was around, like, 2006 or seven, and, like, I never really went back to watch them, but I did watch them quite a few times to try to get a better grasp of what the show was about, especially due to the fact that, like, when I was binging those series specifically, I always did it late at night, so I always fell asleep somewhere through my watching of it, so I'd always have to go back and watch, like, the previous night's episodes again and again till I was eventually done with the series. So, that was kind of something funny. Ryu Kendo is another cool series. Now, I've only watched that three times, but that's three more times than I've watched other tokus that I've claimed to have seen. And I want to go back and watch it because all of my other friends actually either now are just getting into it or already were into the series and were always hoping that it would get more to it. The suits are wonderful. They're nice. And I think the toys were actually made by Takara. So, that's a really interesting series. Now, if I recall correctly, one of the guys who was in that show, or there were other guys who were in that show, were a couple of the, like, the secondary or extra writers in the series, because I think Kamen Rider Sigurd, Sid from Gaim, was actually in Ryu Kendo, and I think he was also in one of the Shosei series, but I could be wrong. Like, I'd have to actually go and look up his filmography again, but I think he was in those. And then China's Armor Heroes, like, I think they put them up for free on YouTube just a couple of years ago, and I watched, like, pretty much a few of the seasons, and if I recall, they are subbed on YouTube, I'm just not really sure, because I just, I watched all of them, 
and I don't know if I watched them over again. Like, I was just putting them on either as background noise, and I'd look up when I'd start realizing a fight would happen. And I think the thing about the show is, it is a lower production, it is a lower budget, but I still think that people should check these shows out. Like, I'm going to give it another watching, like, actually seriously sit down and watch it over the course of the summer as long as they're still on YouTube, hopefully, or if someone has a torrent with good English subs, I will do that in a heartbeat. Because you know what? When you look to the tokus that are outside of Japan from, like, China and, like, Indonesia, they're not going to be the best of suits. They're not going to be the best of visual effects. But sometimes they really try to make up for it with their stories. Just like with Bima Satria Garuda. I've heard nothing but good things for it. I've seen the first two episodes. I wasn't too hooked into it at the time. But, like, I have friends that actually, like, watch that shit religiously when it was airing and while it's still airing and so so on and so forth that I have a lot of good faith especially due to the fact that it was sort of a loose co-production with Shitori Ishinomori Productions and the Toei like they actually licensed them out for suits as well as had some common writers I think it was just common writer black make a guest appearance in the series so I'm but he wasn't as black he was as a character within the uh, Garuda universe so I really think that once I watched Satria Garuda, I'm going to be, like, hooked on that show. But the main event is the Ultra series. Now, there's so many Ultras, ultras where it comes to, you have your show era, you have your Heisai era, you have, like, a few OVA movies or OVA series, and then you have, like, so many Subaraya productions that are related to it that I still have yet to see. One of the only ones I know I've seen is Gridman, and at the time I saw it, there was only, like, 14 to like maybe 10 to 14 episodes actually subbed on Crunchyroll back in the day and after that when Crunchyroll became more of a legit service and they started getting off all of the uploaded videos and were uploading their own licensed stuff pretty much those went bye bye I never saw them again and I really did enjoy the story that was at hand but when it came to the Ultra series, there's at least so many ways, whether it be fan subs, official releases, or actually... No, that still technically counts as an official release, whether it be on home video or put up for streaming. So there's just so, like, so many platforms, at least, for an official release to have seen these series that it's just incredible. Like, Ultra Q, I didn't think I was ever going to get to see that series, like, subbed. Like, I remember seeing so many like raw footage scenes put up on youtube fan sites and when we finally got the release from shout factory i was astonished like i didn't think anyone was going to touch this even fan subbing groups with like a 10 foot pole and when q came out this was after i had already seen the original ultraman series i've seen other series but i want to start where it all came from so when i saw Q finally, after so many years of seeing what Ultraman had became and seeing where it was like more of a Twilight Zone with kaiju esque stories, it was magical. Like, Ultra Q is just one of my favorite series because it's literally, like I said just seconds ago, Twilight Zone meets kaiju, meets the toku salsu genre perfectly. And What's really cool about it is kind of how it treats itself like, loosely like a reoccurring revolving door with the same cast, naturally, that work at this one newspaper area. Like, literally, like, they work for a newspaper, and, like, all these crazy things just happen, and it just always seems to happen to, like, them. So, like, every episode seems to be, like, set in their own sort of universe. However, there are episodes that do relate back to events from previous episodes, but that's only, like, a small amount. But it's just magic. It's amazing. So then when we actually look at the Ultra series as a whole, the original is just fantastic. I love it dubbed. I love it subbed. I just overly enjoy it. I like a lot of the kaiju that are still used from the original series and the seijins that we still see over the years. It's just like magic to me i i love stuff like red king i love stuff like gamora the baltons mephilus and zeton like those iconic characters are so incredible and the episodes that occur in the series are just 
great. And then when we get to seven, it's just a really crazy series because when I was a teenager, I was like, man, this show is amazing. It's awesome. And then as like my mind matured, I looked at it and I was like, man, this show is very dark and the tones are like there. Like it, like when I matured, I was noticing like how different the show looked than Ultraman. And at times I say to myself, if I had a kid and I wanted him to start watching him or her to start watching Toku, I probably would not show them seven first because it is a drastically darker tone series than Ultraman was, but yet I still enjoy it. I still think it's one of those ones where when you come, if you go in a chronological order and you go from Ultraman to Seven, it's just like saying, let's take Batman the Animated Series and go right to the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. It's like two different things it feels like. It's just so drastically insane. And I know for a fact, like, other shows in the show era, like Leo, Ace, and Taro, and Jack, do that a lot. Like, they switch up how they respond. Like, either depending on how, I guess, the company felt, or Superaya felt, while doing the shows, it was like, like, hey, there are stuff that's an issue here, either because they were trying to tell a story with the, the politics of the world, with the Cold War, with, like, the issues in Japan, and they were using these elements to help convey how they felt as a whole, which really make you go, damn, Showa era can be, like, cheery and awesome entertainment, or it can be, like, almost like an operatic drama-esque thing, which makes you go, damn, just damn. So I just love the ways that it tries to just change its themes throughout that era. And then the Heisai era to now has been very, in a sense, more of a light-hearted take on all of those elements and does it in a way that it feels more like all family entertainment because when I saw Tiga on the Fox box, I was like, what is this mess? I still watched it because it was Tiga, but I knew the dub was off. Like, I knew it had to be completely off. So when I finally went out and saw it, I saw, like, the Spanish subs. I saw it raw. I saw it subbed. And it took me forever to get, like, a full, full series of it, like, with just the same team subbing it. So it was really good that I finally got it, but, like... I had seen it so many times that it's one of those series that, aside from having seen it on the Fox box, it's really good. Like, people say, oh, Tiga's not that great. And they always seem to compare it to just the Fox box dub rather than having sat down and watched it. Then we're going to skip Dinah because, honestly, I barely even touched that. I, I should, but I haven't. There was Gaia, and Gaia was just really cool. It had, like, a quite a bit of actors that I'm acquainted with already because like Hiroyuki Watanabe, you had Cake Boss in there before he became Cake Boss. A few other actors, some of them were already seen from other tokus or actually just had been recently seen due to Tiga and the Heisai Ultra 7 series. And it's really cool, especially due to the fact you have Gaia and Agul, who for first half of the series are facing off with each other and having this conflict with each other because they represent different attributes. One represents wanting to protect all life on Earth, and Agul just wants to protect Earth because that's what it's supposed to do, is just protect the planet and allow itself to establish its own ecosystem rather than protecting the current, you know, top of the food chain where Gaia is like that. Then I saw the Ultra N project where we had the, the Next and Nexus. Really interesting shows. They're really good. I think it had a great story, but it got cut off way too soon. Then there's Mabius for me, Ultra 7X, and Orb. Like, those three shows are probably, like, really good in their own rights. Ultra 7X, people try to hate on it because it doesn't really feel like an Ultra series. It just feels like a futuristic cop drama with Ultraman thrown in there, which it kind of is. It really kind of is, but I still enjoy it. Mabius felt like a really good anniversary series, and it really stood on its own. And then Orb, like, out of nowhere, like, I enjoyed Ginga, I enjoyed Ginga S, and I even enjoyed uh, X, but Orb just came in there and was like, yo, 
we cast this actor, Hideo Ishiguri, who was from Kamen Rider Den O, and, like, I'm just like, oh, shit, they're, like, using him as his selling point. They're using, like, the abilities of fusion as a selling point. And then, like, foreshadow a form, and I'm like, oh, crap, he uses Belial. I'm like, yep, it uses Belial. And I was like, oh, damn. And then, like, they get this weird anarchistic best friend of his, Juggler, as his, like, foil. And it was, like, magic. Like, I, I know people who hate on Orb for no apparent reason, but it's magic. And now, if there's other Ultra series that you know I've skipped, like I stated, like, most of the show era, the reason why I didn't talk about those is stuff I've binged. It's not that I haven't seen them all into their entirety, which some are the case, preferably Ultraman Jack and Ace, because, like, those never really had a full sub, nor dub, English dub, that I know of. So, like, those are still off the table for me, but... Out of the ones I did mention that I've binged consecutively, those are just ones that, like, speak to me. They, I think, in a sense, not the, do they just entertain me, but the, the themes and elements to their stories have a driving point that keeps my interest hooked. Like, whether there be, like, character romance, character-driven, like, I need to overcome something, or just the story of destiny and fate that sometimes happens in the Heisei era is what really keeps me a lot with the Ultra series. Like, that is probably up there. Like, when, when people ask me, what do I think of Toku, I think of it as this. You have your Ultraman, your Rider, your Sentai, and your Metal Hero. And those three of them, yes, are from Toei. But when you put them in their league, Ultraman is just their equal. They are equals that shift in the polarities of who is on top and who is on the bottom. It's always a revolving door with which series is really the best because honestly for years even though I loved Sentai because I grew up with Power Rangers Sentai was always like my always stuck at my number two and Ryder and Ultraman would switch between first place and third place and then eventually as I got to see more Metal Heroes it became like oh these two are tied in first these two are tied in second and it was like it was either split down the middle like ties or shit was just revolving due to the current airing shows at the time and that's what I love when you look at like the three main Toei produced productions of T T Toku and when you look at the Ultra franchise just their magic and they're like they're like lightning in a bottle that seems to come around more often than people say you can like capture lightning or lightning strikes twice like like, these shows try to be able, or are able to, like, capture that entertainment, which pr provingly shows why they're able to either come back from the dead, or just keep on with the longevity of just the, the people knowing about the franchise, or the people actually being able to enjoy the franchise to a weekly to yearly basis. Nevertheless, though, like I said, that's practically all I can say for what I binge when it comes to Toku. The next two episodes, I hope to wrap up this whole Stuff I Binge segment with anime, cartoons, and like live-action shows, whether it be from America or other shows from Japan or like the UK. Nevertheless, though, don't forget to follow me on social media, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and check out this show yet again here on YouTube and or here on SoundCloud, depending on where you're listening to it. Nevertheless, I'll see you all next time.